Hello and welcome to this year's UCSS conference for the New Global Movement. Um, we're all very excited to present this um, Resistance in Latin America panel. It's going to be followed by a keynote roundtable. You can read about it in your program here. It has dinner and drinks afterwards. Uh, we hope you'll stay for that too. And then tomorrow we have another series of very exciting panels um, that we hope you all will attend. So without further ado, um, Linda Citrin. Go ahead. Okay, um, so I'm going to be discussing slash facilitating and moderating the panel. And I'm just going to introduce people by their name and the university affiliation where they start. So actually people are speaking in the order in which they're in the program. So we have Kelly Bauer first from George Washington University speaking about um, the experience of in Chile with the Mapuche and the religion of the state. Is this on? Does that work? Yes, absolutely. Pretty small anyways. Um, first of all, I just wanted to thank the coordinators of this for putting this together. Um, there aren't so many Latin Americanists at GW, so I was very excited to find people that you know kind of are on the same wavelength as I am. Um, like you can see, my project is called Setting an Example of the Chilean Government's Recent Experiences Processing Mapuche Land Requests. And my goal in this is to try and understand how the government is responding to the demands of the Mapuche indigenous community. So you can see in that red area, that's where um, now we would say the majority of the Mapuche community lives, although a lot have um, moved to, to more urban areas. Um, and there, as you might know, there are lots of conflicts over land. I would kind of say that's where um, the, the difficulties arise from, and it's all about which land is historically claimed as, as rightfully Mapuche land. This has escalated to internationally publicized hunger strikes, allegations of terrorism. You might have heard of some of these more um, politicized issues, but I'm focusing on kind of, I guess, what I would call the base of the, the demand to the request for land. And my main question is how do groups' mobilization efforts affect government decision making? So I'm really trying to figure out what is the outcome of these, of these efforts. So obviously this ties into the social movement literature and the difficulty of trying to understand outcomes or success or any of that sort of um, any of that sort of definition. Um, so I chose to look at something very specific and very concrete. Um, so the demand for land and whether the government has responded to that or not. Um, this also feeds in a little, a little bit to the state distant literature, and this is how I use to this is the literature I use to try and get at how I would expect the state to respond. So understanding the costs and benefits involved to the government and trying to maximize um, their ability to govern the particular area. It's kind of the, the bias I go into it with. Um, my argument is that to decrease the potential of future threats, the government creates an example out of Mapuche groups engaging in more violent mobilization tactics by prioritizing the demands of a neighboring group's, by prioritizing the requests of a neighboring group's demands. So I'll go into a little bit more of that detail um, but another point I want to make is just that the, the state dissident literature usually focuses on the, the actions and the demands of the group that's presenting the demand as one and the same. So I'm trying to separate that apart and distinguish between the actions that the group takes versus how the government responds to the demands. So in this case, um, the separation between the, the tactics that they use to mobilize and the actual land request that they're trying to fulfill. So just some background on the situation that I'm looking at. Um, in 1993, Chile passed an indigenous law. And among a lot of other things, um, what's important for this project is it gave the indigenous ministry, Conadi, the authority to resolve land disputes. So when there was a Mapuche community that had a historical claim to a section of land, it created this institutional path that they could use to go through to receive that land back. Um, the vast majority of these requests are approved. It requires a significant amount of, of paperwork and kind of tracing back the claim that that community has and the ties they have to that section of land. So the majority of them that are completed are approved. So you can see since 1994, only 27 have been denied. Um, the problem though is that there's a big difference between approving and implementing um, that land transfer. So as you can see, only 16 have been resolved per year, which as of 2010, which is as far as um, I could get the data for. 582 are still pending resolution. So I'm really trying to get at what does it take for the government to act on that demand and implement um, that reform. The dependent variable that I'm looking at is the amount of money the government paid for a particular piece of land. And you can see some of the range in that. Um, and the way that I started to analyze this, this just shows each dot is each land transfer that the government has on record. So this is the whole, um, this is the whole range each dot includes every single land transfer that's happened. 
from 94 to 2008. Um, and as you can see, most of these land requests are resolved as you may expect. So I did OLS regression on this, and the, major the vast majority of the variation can be explained by the number of families, the location of the land, where it's, area where it's located, um, the number of families, um, some of those kind of basic indicators, explains the majority of this variation that you see there. Um, the two that I have labeled, and kind of what, I, what the main story of this project is, is um, the deviant cases. And why is the government willing, in some cases, to go far above and beyond what we would expect? based on how many acres of land, how many families are involved, what location the land is on. Um, so the two cases that are labeled are the, the cases that I analyzed in more detail here. Um, and in my paper, I have some more, some more description of the, the methods I used to reach that. But these are by far the two most extreme cases. So you can see the one in 1999 that was approved, um, based on, again, those indicators of the, the, the quantity of land, the number of families, the location, some of that. Um, the expected price the government would pay for the land was $1 million. In actuality, it was $3.6 million. And for the one in 2002, estimated to be $2 million, um, and $3.4 million was the actual price that they paid. So you can see the difference, at least the, the variables that I have included and the variables that the government makes available um, don't explain why they spent so much money on that particular section of land. So the case studies I'm using to try and figure out um, what additional factors aren't accounted for in those in that data that um, the government makes available, which obviously is fairly limited. So the big story here, like I mentioned before, is that um, each of those two deviant cases, there's always a story of two communities next to each other making claims to land that's next to each other. Um, the difference is that one engages in much more violent mobilization strategies, so so be illegally occupying the land, um, encounters with the police, hunger strikes, some more of those. Um, more drastic measures, and the neighboring community is much more um, much more passive. You would say something like um, like mobilizing in the capital, peaceful protest. Um, there's no direct engagement with the police. Um, so the story for the one that was um, returned in 1999, there was an international corporation that was holding the land that the the two Mapuche communities had historical claims to. Um, again, one engaged in much more peaceful protest, the other one much more violent. Um, and some of you may be aware there's some um, um, disagreements over whether to call some of these actions terrorism or not. Um, but regardless of whether, say this does not count as terrorism, um, but eight Mapuche community members of the one engaged in more violent um, measures were put in jail during this time. So not necessarily terrorism, but it is indicative of them taking more, more drastic measures. Um, this all started in February of 2000, um, or no, sorry, February of 1999. Um, by March of 2000, the community that was engaged in much more peaceful protest received their 2,000 hectares of land that they had requested. Um, the other one is still waiting for their land, so the government did not take that action to act on, on the request that they had. Um, in the future, this had a big, the difference between the two communities has had a significant impact on what the communities have done since. So the community that received the land is, is almost non-existent online. Um, it's very hard to find information about um, mobilization or what activities they're engaged in, whereas the one that was engaged continues to be very much um, mobilizing in the same ways. So the response of the government has kind of entrenched their demands and entrenched the strategies that they use to achieve those. The, the second, the 2002 case, um, these are all images from, from that struggle. So same story, there are two communities next to each other. Um, one started to engage in much more peaceful protests to receive that land, the other one more radical, as you can see some of the the conflicts with police here. Um, there continue to be stories of police entering the community, um, firing off rubber bullets, there are allegations of mistreatment of children. So the same sort of story happens. The, the government returned the land of the more peaceful community, not of the, the other one, and that, that decision had a significant impact on the way the communities have continued to mobilize and interact with the government since. Um, so just to conclude, um, the basis of this is that I'm trying to find uh, or I'm trying to figure out what are the outcomes of social movements, or not necessarily of social movements, but of particular interactions between a group making demands and how the government is going to respond with that. Um, the important part is to, for me to recognize the, the differences in how different groups mobilize and what demands they're making. So in this case, particularly, the difference between the mobilization strategies of the two neighboring communities had a significant impact on how the government responded. Um, so the government is trying to prioritize the demands of one in order to 
kind of take the or to um, to de incentive or to, to sorry to take away the incentive for more radical mobilization. So showing that there's some priority to more peaceful um, interactions with the government. In some ways, I think this says something about the Chilean government is somewhat successful. The vast majority of Mapuche communities are not engaging in violent mobilization, and they do work through very institutionalized um, means of relating to the government and attempting to resolve their demands. However, for the communities that haven't worked through this process and haven't received their demands, it's entrenched those and kind of ra further radicalized the steps that the community is willing to take in order to receive their demands. Um, in terms of future research, um, a lot of this comes down to data collection. What I have is only based on what the government publishes. It's obviously very limited in terms of what the community looks like, what the bigger political economic structure looks like. Um, so that is avenues for future research. But I look forward to whatever other comments you have. Thank you. So for the sake of time and a full discussion, I'm not actually either, I'm not going to respond now or ask other people to respond. We're going to have everyone's perspective, which you'll see as we go that certain people are studying similar regions or similar kinds of protest, resistance, disruption. So it makes sense actually when you hear everyone together. So next we have Leslie Finger, yeah. from Harvard, also talking about Chile, but flashing forward to the last two minutes. exploring the roots of the Chilean winter, how salient issues shape political participation. Um, and for anyone who happened to read the paper, it has sort of evolved <laughs> since the paper, so um, it's not going to be exactly what you read. Um, and in particular, I'm working right now on sort of like theory building, so any ideas about uh, along the theory line of things would be much appreciated. Okay, so I'm going to talk a little bit about um, my motivation for writing this paper. Um, possible explanations for these protests, um, the theory I want to propose, um, some preliminary results, and then some next steps. Okay, so this paper was certainly motivated by the Chilean winter, which is the name given for the huge student protests that occurred uh, our last summer, so starting around May 2011, um, that really haven't been resolved, and they lasted for months, and they were huge. Um, and they were really um, a response, they were really about Chile's highly privatized for-profit education system. Um, so, and they were notable people, you know, in the media, they were notable for having been like the biggest uh, movement since uh, the 80s under the dictatorship. Um, so really a notable thing that people up here have been paying attention to. Okay, but this raises several questions. Um, first, why now? This system has been around since the early 80s. Um, you know, so what explains why suddenly people are upset about it, or why suddenly they're mobilizing over it? Um, and why protest? Chile is considered uh, one of the more healthy democracies in Latin America. Um, it's considered to have strong institutionalized parties with deep historical and societal roots. So why aren't people like voting? You know, why aren't they um, expressing their demands that way? And then to tie these two questions together, um, how can we explain how participation has changed over time? So how did these people go from being voters to being protesters, if we can sort of zoom out a little bit? Okay, so there are several explanations in the literature and in the media. When you read about um, what this, when you read about this movement, some people sort of like to say it's really a generational thing. This is the first generation to come of age in democracy, so they're not afraid of repression, and maybe they're disillusioned with uh, Chilean consensual politics. So that's one possible explanation. Okay. Um, then in the social movements literature, there's quite a bit about sort of more structuralist reasons that um, this movement has to do with maybe like changes um, in society and in the economy have led to um, more uh, salient frustrations, sort of different changing relations between people. Um, so we might relate this to inequality in Chile's case. And then another possible explanation is this has something to do with diffusion, right? This, 
it seems a little eerie that this happened like right around the same time as the Arab Spring and the uh, crisis in the Eurozone and all that. So I'm, I don't dispute that any of these might have some interesting things to say. Um, but I'm more interested in thinking about how we can talk about institutions and the government. So there's a large body of literature in um, what we call like political process school that looks at something called political opportunity structures. And I want to build on this approach. So political opportunity structures um, are kind of a fuzzy concept in the literature, um, but I would point to two clear definitions of what this is. So um, Kitchell, in a seminal 1986 work that looks at um, movements, anti-nuclear movements in the 70s, uh, talks about that political opportunity structures are really institutions, um, and that um, they shape how movements behave and the outcomes they have. For my purposes, I'm interested in um, his definition as to how, uh, you, how to how movements behave. So he has this whole thing about um, whether they're open or closed. So whether institution, whether political opportunity structures are open or closed are going to affect the strategies that a movement takes. And so an open political opportunity structure would be something like having lots of parties, um, being able to get your voice into the legislature, getting being able to get your bill in front of representatives. And so in those cases, we might see voting more because people like feel like they have a voice, right? They're more access points. Um, a closed political opportunity structure would be one where there aren't those things. There are fewer parties. It's harder to get people to listen to you. So those would be ones where we'd see people protest. A different sort of definition of this concept um, is probably more prevalent. And this is more that political opportunity structures are kind of informal, like changes in the ruling alliance or shifts in power. Um, and these would, it, these just, inspire people to come together and overcome collective action and form a movement. So I, I kind of have a problem with both of these. Um, I think the first is a little too deterministic. If it has to do with institutions, then wouldn't we see places with open political opportunity structures never having protests, and wouldn't we see places with closed ones always having protests? And then the ter more tarot second definition is a little bit ambiguous. It's like hard to measure it and hard to know it when you see it. And then both of these really are like don't take a stance on how the issue plays a role. Both of these definitions sort of take as given that there's some grievance and there's some issue, and they don't think about that the issue might affect how movements mobilize. So, okay, so this brings me to my theory. So, I would like to tie in, I would like to make a conceptual amendment to this, uh, this concept. So I think that um, Kitchell's open-close division that, um, movements respond to access points being available is really valuable, but I think it needs to be tied to an issue. Okay, so I think I, I think a political opportunity structure is only relevant, um, its openness or closeness is only relevant as it pertains to an issue. So, um, I wanna put forward a theory saying that the government um, interacts with salient issues to determine whether it's open or closed. So this is kind of like the theory I wanna, I wanna put forward. So I think that there's, when there's a salient issue, the government signals whether whether, how, whether it's going to take action on that issue, whether it's open to hearing about this issue. And then this creates a perception of whether the political opportunity structure is open or closed, and then this determines the individual's own willingness to participate. So, okay. Now, as the, for the paper I have already written, I'm sort of looking at how this first box connects to the last box. So I want to, so I've used uh, Latino barometer data from uh, 2006 and 2007, which would be just at the beginning of when these education protests were starting to happen. It was right around the Penguin Revolution, which was when a bunch of high schoolers started protesting in 2006. Um, and I want to see if we can see like whether there's a relationship between um, issues and participation. Okay. So turns out um, I find that they are there is a relationship between them. So. Um, when I look at these two years, you find that people who are discontent with um, the education system in 2006 are more willing to vote, whereas in 2007, they're more willing to protest. So to help you see that a little bit. Here, I'm taking um, first differences from a logit regression on all these different, these are all different outcomes. Um, and you see in 2006 that somebody who's unhappy with education, um, with the education system, is more likely to want to vote. And this is sort of like a, an op, how I operationalized <laughs> unhappiness with education, which is maybe not so important for right now. However, for 2007, you see a little bit of a shift. So here you see that actually people are more likely to, people who are dissatisfied with education are more likely to want to protest or petition than 
uh, than somebody who's not dissatisfied with education. And then this, um, this figure over here are people who think education is a more important issue. Okay, so, so what I've done then is I've sort of like, there's clearly like some middle thing missing here. There's some middle, maybe I want to say, shift in how people are perceiving the, government, the um, openness or closeness of uh, the political opportunity structure. Okay, so this is sort of the work I need to do more of. Um, I think that if you look at what's going on politically um, in the education system, how, how um, the government is dealing with education during this time, you see that the government is signaling differently. So in 2006, there are these huge um, protests called the Penguin Revolution where all these high schoolers are protesting transportation fees and uh, fees to pay for testing. Um, and Bachelet, the president at the time, responds <coughs> by saying, okay, we're going to have a commission, and she says we're going to take action on this, we're going to work to think about a new law that repeals the Pinochet era law. Um, and so I would say in this period, it's the political opportunity structure is open. And so people, this is manifesting in people um, perceiving voting as a viable avenue. Um, however, by 2007, when I did the uh, second regressions, there's widespread dissatisf dissatisfaction. The law is stalled in Congress. Um, the law doesn't quite reflect what a lot of people wanted. So I would contend that the reason we see this shift in attitudes is that people are actually starting to perceive the um, political opportunity structure as closed. And unfortunately, I only have these two years of data. It'd be cool to, you know, do it up to 2011, up to the recent protests. But I think you start to see the shift in perceptions of the political opportunity structures, absent any like institutional shift, as Kitchell would tell us, are important and things like that. So that's what I have. I'm really looking forward to hear any comments anyone has. Thanks. Okay. And then next we have. Well, we're sitting in a different order, but yeah. I suppose we could extend um, yeah. Alarcón Ferrari, who's from Cornell University, um, speaking about actually both Brazil and, and Chile. And just interesting to note here, aside from some of us being um, PhDs or PhD students, it turns out from myself to the left, we're all also lawyers, which is just <laughs> a funny quick that we just discovered. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, I am a visiting fellow at Cornell University. Just to verify that I am the instructor of Sala University and the Swedish University of Agricultural Sciences. Even when I am a lawyer, I am really working with agrarian issues today. So, the ideas that I want to present here and to uh, share with you guys are related to what is going on in the lands in Latin America and I guess in many other parts of the world today, in which we are witnessing the new struggles for the land in a way that remember us uh, other moments in the history of capitalism. And the argument that I want to uh, put here is that uh, in, both in literature and in our common understanding of movement, we tend to classify movement as social movement even when they are dealing with many other issues. So I would like to argue for the idea or the concept of a social ecological movement. And I would like to show some pictures of uh, some examples of movements in Brazil and Chile that are really trying to do it. And I mean here that the people in the ground when struggling, with, when trying to do something different, they don't separate the social from the ecological. And one of the main articulations between the social and the ecological is through labor. And um, when it comes to labor, uh, I will focus on peasants. Peasantries and the prefigurative politics of peasants in uh, South America. This is from Chile in 2009. People in the southern part of the country, the same close to the area in which the Mapuche conflict is taking place today, and also one of the areas in which the, in which the forestry sector is the most developed in the country, and the Chile forestry sector is huge, it's one of the 10 five uh, exported of power to all of the world here it's in, in the US. So it's, uh, there are a lot of uh, forest resources from Chile, actually. And in this area, there is uh, a big issue related to land. So what people are trying to do today is to develop agroecology 
as a way to first confront the forestry sector and the agribusiness sector and to give the possibility to the peasants in order to continue preserving the land and doing a use of the land that is highly ecologically based use of the land. So what they are, they are trying to do here is to, for example, in this experience, this uh, visit to an agroecological farm, is to show from a very practical point of view how people can use the land using, uh, fortunately, I, I'm not sure if you can see the difference, but uh, the main point with agroecology is to try to use the land uh, in a way that uh, combines different species. It's not a monoculture way of uh, managing the land. And what is interesting in this picture is that in the mountain there, you have a big area that is very green. And that's what people in the area call the green desert. Those are pine plantations that are expanding all over the countryside. And they are the basis of the power sector in the country. And this is the way that people are trying to articulate these different um, uh, proposals. Meeting together, sharing experiences, and also making a lot of politics in the very ground. And this NGO tried to connect peasants with the students, with professionals, and other people that are trying to uh, foster peasant economies or peasants' ways of uh, using the land. Right. The second experience that I am using in my case uh, comes from uh, Brazil. And this is a pic that I took uh, just three months ago in January. And this is the, a, a camp of the landless uh, movement in Brazil. And behind the, the tent, you have a huge um, mill that is owned by an international company. That is a picture of the contradictions of the agrarian uh, development in Brazil today. And this is what people are calling the agrarian question. If we remember the idea of agrarian question, so we can start looking at, for example, Marx and the idea of uh, thinking the capitalist agriculture, um, well, covering the European countryside, then Kautsky with this idea of the writing question as something that was really destroying the peasantries. And also the discussion about uh, agrarian questions and the role of peasants has been a really important component of the historical trajectory of the critic of capitalism, Luxembourg, Cheyenne, and others can be remembered here. So I just put the issue of this discussion within the historical critic of capitalism as a matter that has been very related to the agrarian question as a way to introduce this experience in Brazil. Because what uh, is going on here is that, uh, if you look here, uh, two kind of monocultures, right? Soybean in one case and corn in the other, mostly for export. So this area is Rio Grande do Sul, the same area in which the World Social Forum is taking place, if you're familiar with that. But if you go from Porto Alegre to the countryside, you're going to see these kind of uh, plantations and monocultures in many parts. So as a contra hegemonic uh, project, uh, peasants are getting together through cooperatives and they are again using agroecology in order to manage the land and using different, uh, mono, uh, different species. Today they are able to produce a lot of food, to deliver a lot of food for schools too, through political negotiations in Rio Grande do Sul. And they are today doing something that can be regarded as some of the most interesting experiences related to peasantries. Because if you're familiar with the Brazil and the discussion on bioenergy and energy in the broadest sense, uh, today there are big efforts to use, uh, well, basically food in order to produce energy, right? This is one of the ways of um, understanding how capital accumulation today try to really get new sources of energy in light of the a peak oil and other energy scarcities. Um, so I'm not going to get into the discussion on biofuels, but just to say that these peasants and their cooperatives are trying to produce ethanol too, which for many people is quite a shocking experience, right? Oh, what are they going to do? They are doing the same. So my argument here is that they are not doing the same because basically they are producing ethanol just for own consumption and the surpluses will be delivered to the local communities through local markets, right? And the way they have to organize labor here is completely different. So we have here a source of difference in relation to the uh, big ethanol and capitalist sector. So peasant here, and of course they have to negotiate, this is uh, the micro distillery that they are using today. Uh, for doing it, they needed some money, right? So they got some money from Petrobras, which is a big company, 
but they argue saying that, well, this is a semi-state company and, well, somehow they need to get some technology in order to develop this initiative. So, just making the comment because these issues are very sensitive in social movement, right, and social and ecological movement too. So how, is, how are you getting the money to do it, right? This is a classical question in, you know, um, well, let's say, um, the struggle that social movement and social ecological movement have inside the movement. I mean, legitimacy issues, not being co-opted and things like that. But they are managing it in a very good way because today they are getting the technology, but they still they are creating a network of micro distilleries in many parts and putting together peasants in order to produce for themselves energy. Or not producing because we are not producing energy, but to produce bioenergy or biofuel through these uh, experiences, right? So this is another uh, picture from the same area. Here you have the micro distiller in the middle of the campsite. That one is really nice because they, at the same time that produce ethanol, they produce sugar, they produce cachaça too, and they produce other uh, things, right? And what uh, I want to start finishing here is to make Okay, right. Um, so, what I am trying to do in the paper, which is very work in progress, this is a little bit of work that I do uh, beside my PhD, is to really think this question of labor and ecology, right? Um, because the struggles that we have ahead are going to be very based on this idea of how to reconstitute the relationship between labor and ecology. If we take social ecological crisis seriously, right? I mean, if people don't think here that we have social ecological crisis going on, so we can start discussing that. But if I take it for granted that we believe that because of the historical trajectory of capitalism we are today witnessing the social ecological crisis, we have to start thinking how can we organize labor, an organized relation of consumption and production that can counterwork capitalism. And what peasants can do today is to, to do something that other movements cannot actually, which is to offer prefigurative politics that are related with productive autonomy, right? They can produce food, and in the paper I'm quoting one of the <coughs> a pamphlet of this movement in Brazil, which they say that because they can produce their own food, they are in a better position to face the economic crisis today, right? Other workers cannot produce food, so they can do whatever they need to do in order to get food. One of the big uh, victories of capitalism has been to separate food production from workers' own lives, right? So I'm trying to make that argument too. So these kind of contemporary struggles in the South American countryside are going to be very relevant not only for what is going to do, happen with these communities, it can be very relevant what, with what is going to happen with the alliances that they can generate in the future. I'm thinking here in the traditional classical alliance between the workers and the peasants, right? And then we can start discussing that kind of conflict. But that effort in order to put together peasant and worker has been one of the main issues in Latin American politics in the last 50 years. For example, Chile cannot, the, the experience of the socialist movement in Chile cannot be understood without thinking the alliance between the peasants and the workers, right? It was a very complex alliance. I mean, I'm not saying that things are fast, they're easy here. I'm just saying that we have here examples of people trying to think in this term, and I think that this, this is so relevant today. And finally, and if you're familiar with the work of A.P. Thompson, maybe you're going to see the connection here. And I'm talking about the historical making of social ecological movements. And in this way, I try to conceptualize what these movements are doing, but I'm not trying to do it for myself, but I'm trying to work together with my uh, friends that are trying to do these kind of things, because we are realizing all the time that in the countryside, people don't see this different. I mean, this binary opposition between the ecological and the social, or you are a part of a social movement, I am a part of an ecological movement, doesn't exist. People, in many cases, engage in both. And in big part of the literature, we still today try to think in terms of the ecological movement there, social ecological movement there, to make the separation all the time, right? So. The final thing I would like to say that this has to do with history, right? I mean, when historical materialism kind of forgot in history, we got in troubles at the theoretical level, I would say. So in order to recover the very basic idea of historical materialism, in order to think historical processes through the lens of agencies and movements that are reconfigured and reconstituted all the way along the struggles, 
I think that a good way to start thinking this question of how social ecological movements are in the making today, how they can struggle, and hopefully, hope can we win this struggle. So that would be my presentation. November 2006. In Belo Horizonte, the fifth largest Brazilian city, a group of eight families occupied a small building in an upper class neighborhood in an action coordinated by the local social movement Brigadas Populares. Their claim can be summarized in the following terms. There is a seemingly unbridgeable gap between the law in the books and the law in action. Even though the Brazilian constitution guarantees the fundamental social right to housing, many families do not have a place to live in both large and small cities. Occupation in this scenario became the only alternative left for those eight families in order to bridge the gap between the constitutional text and the grievances characterized in their own lives. Since this defining action, the occupations organized by Brigadas Populares continued. Two in 2007, two in 2008, one in 2009, and one in 2010. Prompted by the impact of this wave of occupations of the city's social and political landscape, I examined the political development of the regulation of the right to housing and the meanings it acquired vis-a-vis -vis the right to property right in Belo Horizonte during the last decade. So in my analysis, I tried to focus on three specific actors and their different discourses and actions. The social movement, uh, which organized the occupations, the municipal government, uh, in charge of structuring and implementing uh, the housing policy at the local level, and the state court of appeals, uh, responsible for examining and revising the judicial cases at the appellate level, which emerged out of the battles between the occupants and the occupied real estate owners. Uh, all these occupations, they happen in uh, private properties, uh, except for one which before had belonged to the, to the, uh, to the city, and uh, there was a dispute between who really, uh, who, uh, about who owned that property. So the questions that I was interested in this paper were first, how these different actors framed the issues in dispute and the extent to which these different and overlapping frames impact the meaning making of the two rights involved, namely the right to private property and the right to housing. Uh, second, I was also interested in understanding if and how the judiciary constituted and reaffirmed its relative autonomy vis-a-vis uh, -vis the social, uh, represented by the social movement and the executive power. Uh, I try to engage in an interpretive approach, understand that law is made not only within the court, but this uh, law is found and invented in made, and made in a variety of locations, such as discourse of social movements, classrooms, welfare hearings, and so on. Uh, and I was trying to trace the development of, this, of the struggle of the meanings of these rights uh, in this particular case. So in the presentation, I tried to to engage with this, uh, first I'll try to show, to give you an overview of how, how the urban space was regulated in Brazil, the social right to housing and the right to private property. Uh, then how is the, uh, the housing uh, policy organized on the local level? And then how the dispute uh, undergone in the, in the courts and uh, I examine all the, the judicial cases that I, I mentioned here. Uh, so, Brazilian developmental process began in the 30s, uh, and it was it's described as a cohesive capitalist path because there was an alliance between the state and the uh, and uh, private uh, bourgeois and the bourgeoisie, that, and uh, this process was characterized by an intense urbanization. And nowadays, we have 84 percent of the population living in the metropolitan areas. So, it was a very exclusionary development process. Uh, we had a recognition of property rights, but from a very liberal perspective, and therefore uh, real estate became a commodity, uh, and it wasn't a, uh, most of the population was not able to access uh, the right to housing. So, uh, speculation is what really characterizes uh, the the real estate 
uh, space in Brazil and, uh, and housing deficit was uh, one of the main characteristics. During the, the redemocratization process, we had the emergence of the urban uh, reform social movement in the early, uh, late 70s, early 80s. And the social movement was able to organize an impact in terms of the constitution and guarantee a chapter on urban policy and guarantee that the right to property uh, had to fulfill a social function. So we have the, the, the right to property is guaranteed, but as long as the property uh, fulfills a social function. So there is this whole debate of what the social function means, and it is one of the discourse that the social movements they, they use in terms of uh, uh, for legitimating uh, their struggle and the occupation that they do on private property. They say, well, this private property does not fulfill its social function, therefore it should not be protected by the law and by the judiciary. Uh, the local government, therefore, plays, according to, to the Constitution, a major role in organizing and, uh, and regulating uh, the, urban, the urban space. And in 2000, we had a constitutional amendment that guaranteed housing as a social right. Therefore, there is a requirement now that the state really has to take positive actions in order to guarantee that the social right is fulfilled. And, uh, and then you had, again, powerful social movements uh, pressing on the local level in order to implement the social right. And in many cities we had this innovative participatory policies. I don't know if you heard about the participatory budgeting. And Belarus was is considered to be a pioneer. It was the first city to implement participatory budgeting. And they also implemented participatory budgeting for the housing, uh, for the housing issues. So uh, the Workers' Party won the elections in Belarus in 1992, and from that time on, they initiated a series of reforms, administrative reforms, in order to create these spaces uh, in which uh, the, the uh, popular participation would be able, enable popular participation within uh, the administration. And they created in 1995 this, uh, the participatory housing budget, uh, and the target was for was uh, low income families. So this participatory budget, it requires that every family participates in a nucleus. They have to, uh, first the family has to, to look for a nucleus of the movement of struggle for housing. They have to affiliate to this nucleus. They have to participate in a series of meetings and forums along the an entire year. And at the end, they will decide how many housing units will be built uh, and uh, to whom it will be distributed. Uh, the issue is that at the end, uh, the housing deficit in Belo Horizonte is now 129,404 units, and the number of the families which were contemplated the almost 15 years of this participatory budget was 3,211. So, uh, and, but still, the families they really believed that this was a space to be, a space to to participate. Uh, so my, my, one of my arguments is that uh, the way that it's, it's established this housing program is, works as a technique of governmentality because it's a way to manage those families and, main, and, and, and guarantee that they will be dependent upon the state and they won't organize themselves. Uh, and it creates a structure of surveillance and, uh, and close management of these homeless families who are uh, along the, an entire year participating and expecting that they will get a house at the end. But this never really happens. Uh, however, this process is a two-way process. And uh, on the one hand, you have the, the state attempting to transform and shape and discipline the social world. But on the other hand, you also have society trying to resist and modify and subvert those, uh, those states' categories. And it was in this context that the social movement emerged uh, uh, and very much interested in the legal discourse. So from the very beginning, the social movement uh, was trying to frame uh, the, the struggle uh, from the perspective that there was there uh, a, a dispute between the, how, the right to private property and the right to housing, and in that dispute, the right to housing should be the one to prevail. And, uh, uh, and also, they were always trying to, to frame it as a public issue rather than a private, a private dispute between the, the owners of the private units which were being occupied, occupied uh, and the social movement itself. So this, these occupations in the, uh, in the paper I described them better, but the first occupation was uh, there were eight families living in the Islam and they occupied a small building really close to the Islam in an upper class neighborhood. They were capable of creating this network of support uh, and their slogan is quite interesting. So they said the homeless do not want the right to housing, they want, their, they want housing. 
So they were really trying to frame the occupation as a legitimate and illegal action. And law was all the time mobilized as a way to create a means of the resistance and to advance a new understanding of what this, uh, what this private property meant. This was one of the graffitis that they made. The occupation was called Caracol, what means is Neo, and they were trying to connect with the Zapatista movement. Uh, and uh, this is another occupation uh, that happened in 2007. And then in 2009, we have uh, the, one of the biggest occupations, Occupation Dandara. Uh, it started with 150 families, and now they have around 900 families there. It's a planning the occupation. They have architects and, uh, and uh, uh, biologists participating with that. This is the, the picture of the occupation. They had a, a, a collective hug to the occupation because it was threatened by eviction. Uh, 2010, we had another occupation, and as I examined the paper, in all these cases, all of them, that we had uh, court decisions, and in all the times, except for one dissent opinion, the court rejected the movement's framing. Uh, it was always privileged, the, the right to private property, and, uh, and the argument was that it wasn't a question for the judiciary to enforce the, the, the right to housing, but rather it was a question, a dispute with the, with the local government. And while, because it was, the, the, the issue was set between the social movement and the private owner, uh, and the local government was never present in those cases, it was really, really not possible to responsibilize the local government for, for the absence of the, the social right. And, uh, and what we see at the end is that the judiciary affirms the autonomy of law vis-a-vis -vis the social actor and the local government by saying that law and politics, they operate under different codes. So it wasn't really an issue of politicizing that thing within the court because the law has its, its own autonomy and it operates under different code. That's it. Thank you. Well, I want to thank the politics department to have me here, um, and I want to apologize for Marco. Uh, there has been some interesting times happening right now in Panama, and he's very politically engaged. Um, the right now the current president, the reason why the this is uh, an issue, uh, which is a rival president elected, is a former businessman elected to, elected to um, office. Uh, he's been involved in a really bad corruption scandal uh, involving none other than Silvio Berlusconi in Italy. And, but the thing is, the funny thing is, and I'll explain this in the, in the, in the protest, in the, in the, uh, I'll explain this in the, in the, in the presentation. I remember when I was a kid, um, and the, um, Panama was invaded by the United States, and Panama was under occupation for three or four months. Um, the, prior to that, the reason why the United States invaded was because Manuel Noriega, the dictator of Panama, was said to be involved in drug trafficking. And this caused massive protests in Panama. The thing is that right now, the, the president of Panama is being said is involved in a huge corruption scandal that involves Silver Blues in Italy and the huge conglomerate in Mechanica, and nothing is happening. The only people that are actually going out and protesting for other sort of demands are indigenous peoples. The Navi, Navi Googlis, precisely. Um, and let me see if this works. Yes. Um, and well, the, the, the introduction is basically, and, and the reason why this is a very, work, a very preliminary work in progress is because there's a tug of war between Marco and I in trying to frame this. Because we're using a theoretical frame that basically explains that consumption um, there is two ways you can understand this. Um, there is high demand for commodities from China and Asia. And this basically has prompted the desire to prospect and explore uh, new mineral uh, uh, mines um, in basic areas that are controlled, by, basically controlled and administered by the indigenous populations. But it isn't, there's also another side to it. Uh, the things that urban, urban elites, what do you call urban elites, urban populations in Latin American countries have been, very, have been quite silenced by the desire for immediacy for consumption. And this is actually known by, this is actually framed by a Mexican anthropologist, Nestor Garcia Canquin, and he says um, the fact that uh, 
urban populations are being swayed by this, basically has made that protests are shifting to the, those ex groups that were excluded originally. In Chile, you could argue that the, the pinguinos in the beginning basically were excluded from all sort of saying in their basically education. In Panama, the, development, the developmentalist theory and, and other policies that were, that were implemented in Panama, even during like, the time where Panama and Latin America grew at 8%, basically marginalized or ignored the indigenous peoples. And basically right now that they're doing is trying to claim their rights and trying, to, inter trying to, to push the boundaries of democracy. Things that are not being done with the traditional social groups based in urban areas. Because they have the desire, um, the, the fact that they, they, they are being swayed by the consumption, especially more importantly, by energy demand. And I'll explain this here more precisely. Um, for purpose. Um, basically, indigenous struggles in Latin America politically reclaim and resist encroachment of public spaces of citizenship. And the Navi Bukle case is exemplary, and I'll explain the, the case uh, more in depth later. Um, as globalization homogenizes production and consumption between the Peruvian national, traditional nation state, excluded groups like indigenous peoples fill this vacuum left by traditional urban populations, right? And, but the thing is that this, this, there's a problem here because there are challenges to this multicultural, multicultural citizenship demands that are being pushed by indigenous populations because they put them in a pollution course with urban, urban populations because the thing is that, and this is the problem the talk of Robert and Marco and I, um, cities demand energy and demand a lot of it. But also, this mineral prospecting uh, uh, projects require energy too. And you'll see, and, it that, and, and, um, and the problem with Garcia and Clean's theory is that it's very hard to separate the demands for consumption from the demands for production. And you're going to see this in, this in two graphs. Am I speaking too fast? No? Well, and the, the, first, the first point is to see development as an exclusionary, as exclusionary citizenship. When people talk about development theory as being something that everyone wants to, build, everyone wants to, be, uh, everyone wants to be, become a citizen by being able to enjoy the fruits and the rights of being part of a nation state and a community and the fruits of the community, right? And actually that's a very second thing, right? If you like a Spaniard, if Mexican or Brazilian was not only made up with maintaining specific traditions, but also an active reproduction within the, with the commodities generated by one society. Basically, that happened very much during the ICE period, the industrial substitution industrialization period. But the thing is that during that time, the sad story of that time is that many of these indigenous groups were marginalized or ignored. In Panama, um, this was uh, the case, even during that time of industrialization. But the, the military dictatorship, which was left leaning in Panama, um, basically, just they said, okay, we're gonna give you more rights to the to, to, to of the of the of the resources we're exploiting from your from your lands, but still, you are gonna be sort of excluded from like the bonanza of this. Uh, right now, they're just being excluded. Period. Um, and now we're looking at multicultural citizenship, which is their more expansive definition of citizenship, which is basically the recognition of differences in order to deepen democracy. Right. Um, put some analysis, and the problem that with, with uh, Unsaid and Garcia and Clean's work is that of consumption it cannot be neatly separated from production, especially in the case of energy, and I'll see that later. Uh, well, these are some figures. Between 33 and 40 million indigenous peoples live in Latin America, where five countries right now, comprise 90 percent of all indigenous peoples. These communities are among the poorest in the region. The Nave Google population in Panama is the poorest indigenous population in Panama, period. Um, there are 160,000 people in the Panama in the Northwest. Um, half of all extreme poverty, basically, people that live on less than $1 a day, really less than $1 a day, they live in the Navajo region. But the sad irony of life is that they have, this area sits on large copper mines and rivers, like very fast rivers of great hydroelectric potential. I have some pictures of this, but I just was not smart enough. Uh, but I'll say these are the two graphs, right? This is the first graph. This basically tells you hydroelectric and thermal energy production in Panama and the uh, urban to rural uh, uh, population ratio. As you see, when the in the mid after the after the occupation, 1990, um, and the liberalization of all Panamanian industries and the basically like, destruction of the Panamanian countryside, 
um, the unadrural ratio started increasing very quickly. And that increased urban and that increased urban demand for energy. And that energy basically was met by the construction, like you see, like the electrical energy plants were basically very flat until 2000, and then they started increasing. Thermal energy will always be thermal energy because it's at the margin, it's always the one that you uh, uh, can actually subsidize the demand at the lowest cost. But the things that to, to separate this from this, the things that this, this is, the, this is uh, minor, uh, GDP per capita for a mineral and resource extraction. To separate that from this is difficult because all these exploitations require a lot of energy. And the thing is that one of the, and, and one of the problems with the, Bar, and the Barrio Blanco energy uh, project in the Namibugla region is that there's a 3.5 megawatt uh, plant that is going to be built in the Rio Barro, uh, Barro Blanco in, in, in the Nabuglia region. And the thing is that, that the, marginal amount of mo the, the marginal amount of electricity that's going to provide to, like, the, whole, to the whole energy demand is very minimal. It's 3%. But it will provide all the energy needed to basically help exploit the copper resources that are there. So there, there's a problem there. And and basically, this has sparked recurrent protests, protests in the Gulag region. I remember that in 2010, when president, the president, current president was elected to power, the first few things he did basically was uh, evict uh, like the 300 Navagulag peoples from that area so that actually had a great cattle ranch potential. They all signed a petition, they got into trouble. Um, then, late, they, later that year, there were there were actually more there were actually real protests that the government squashed, but at the same time the the, the they were able the, the Navajo Googlers were able to get the San, San Felix Accords, which basically was a commitment to, to protect water resources and prohibit mineral extraction in the region. The thing is that the government in twenty twelve when it was gonna present these accords to the Panamanian Congress made no mention of Article Five. It's thinking that oh you know what, it's Christmas time, nobody's gonna notice. Um, actually, it was like it was Christmas time. Like they, they really thought this. Um, the things that now Google leadership demanded for electrification and were ignored. Um, how much time? Uh, about a minute. And well, actually, a minute. A minute. Uh, long story short, there was a huge there was a huge protest. Um, even like these protests were like even like, they were savaged by the by the standards. Because actually, even the police used a raping as a, a, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a method of repression. Two dead, scores wounded, um, things got worse. But actually, the, but they were able to, even in, those, in, in, in that time, to negotiate the San Lorenzo Agreement, then started a discussion of the hydroelectrical projects and water conservation. Yet the government was quick to point out that the project was only suspended, and, it was, and if the demands were not met, they were going to call a nationwide referendum, basically pitting urban urban voters against the Navis. and that is a collision course. So, summary: Spirited peoples, indigenous groups, are becoming the force pushing the need for public spaces and a deeper conception of citizenship. But there's a potential for conflict with urban groups and interests linked to commodity extraction, who demand energy for consumption and production. And I'm really sorry, it's that. Okay. Before we start the discussion, we're very sorry we did not introduce Marina Citrine. We, I mean, we assume everybody here her. knows her, but briefly, Marina is a writer, lawyer, teacher, and organizer. She's the editor of Horizontalism, Voices of Popular Power in Argentina. She has just completed Everyday Revolutions, Horizontalism and Autonomy in Argentina, and she's the co-editor of the forthcoming Insurgent in Democracies, Latin America's New Power. Marina has also been published in important journals and magazines, such as the International Journal of Comparative Sociology, Presa Latina, ZNET, Yes Magazine, and others. She holds a JV from CUNY Law School, a PhD in Global Sociology from Stony Brook University, and she's currently working as uh, in her postdoctorate at the CUNY Graduate Center Committee on Globalization and Social Changes. Oh, better late than later, or never. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> 
Great. Well, so then maybe ending on the postdoc there, I would advise them strongly to everyone when you get your PhD. If you can get a postdoc, it's just a really wonderful gig to be able to write and work and think together with other people. <coughs> um, so I, I did take notes on everyone's papers, and I'm not going to ask specific questions of each person, even though I would like to, and maybe over the course of the weekend I can or we can do that. So, I mean, it's always tricky to try to find a way to have a generalized conversation and yet also be specific. One thing, though, I do want to talk about, just really briefly, and it also does relate to my work. So my work has been based in Latin America over the past 20 years or so. Um, but as an organizer, wherever I am, whether that's in Latin America or the US, this past you know, six, eight months in New York, has it's been, I've been in New York, I've been in Spain, and I've been in Greece, so kind of all about the global movements now, and that this conference is about the new movements, but starting with Latin America. So some of what I've been reflecting on over the last few months, and I guess I want to suggest a few things. I know discussing students, and it's really obnoxious, when it's kind of like, well, my work, and so how does your work relate to my work? So I'm going to do that much more broadly, though, in broad questions, kind of what's taking place globally, and then starting this weekend conference in Latin America, and all of you doing really contemporary work in Latin America, I think is really significant, because at least the way I see it in a lot of what's been going on in the movements in Spain and in Greece and in the US, so many of the forms and kind of the articulations of the politics can be grounded in a lot of ways in the movements in Latin America. So whether that's the like, you know, the kind of stop the yabasta of the Zapatistas and the reference to the Zapatistas of the Que se vayan todos and in Argentina, you know, they all must go and this kind of refusal and in that same space opening something up that's new and different and using forms of direct democracy all over. Um, so I guess my two questions, whether you want to answer them or not, each of you, and then we'll kind of open it up, is kind of how you see, and if you see, maybe some of the work you've done related to the movements now, and in particular the question of the form that the movements are taking, so forms of democracy in particular or not, is it direct democracy in Argentina, they talk about horizontalidad, it's amazing how around the world they're using the language of horizontal, and it's a word that actually came out of the autonomous social movements in Argentina after 2001. Um, so kind of the form. And then the question of territorio, which is what in Latin America people have been talking about for quite a few years, and the kind of alternative construction in geographic space. But territorio is not just about physical space. It's the, in Brazil in particular, talking about territorio of like the mind and the body and how you're constructing new ways of being and thinking. So if that kind of came up at all in your work, um, and then maybe one other question would be, because it's come up differently in each of your presentations, kind of the, the point of reference of the movements. Is it looking first and only um, to legislative change? Is it just about some specific demand on an institutional power? Or are some of the movements perhaps looking not just to institutional power, but are they looking, again, kind of in the horizontally, the Zapatistas say, you know, from below and to the left. Like, is there that kind of gaze taking place or forms of organization, or is it about a specific demand that needs to be met? Um, so those are specific ones. And then if there were time, and I'm not sure that there is, so maybe just to think about an answer if you want to. I always think it's just so important to think about why we are working on what we're working on. Like, whoever we are, whatever the current project is or the place is. So, like, what, I mean, what's the intellectual question, but what's the, the passion question? We're all we're talking about movements, so there's got to be some. What is that part? And kind of just kind of the the you and all of it. So I don't know if that's too much sharing, but that's kind of how I do my work. So <laughs> I don't know if people want to respond kind of one at a time to whichever or none, and then we'll open it up for discussion. Is that any of you want to respond to anything? Do you give us an order? No. However. However, whoever jumps in first. But we are already started. Okay, you were nodding most, so you go first. <laughs> Me? <laughs> well, and I'm also picking on you because I know the movements you work on specifically actually do relate much more directly, as I think the work that Christiane was doing this as well. Um, okay, so I guess, I guess in my presentation, uh, I was more focused because of the of the legal background and because I was working as a lawyer with this particular social movement. I was part of the movement and I was playing the role of being a lawyer in all this case. 
I was really interested in to what extent uh, this political struggle could intervene in the space of law, which in Brazil is, is still a very closed and uh, bounded space, and it's really hard. It has a, it's still a very positivist approach to legal issues, and it's really hard to change those things. So, to what, like trying really to bridge this gap between what is the law in the books and uh, and the and the real lives of those people who are trying to achieve those that social right. Uh, so the point of the reference of the movement was not only uh, this, uh, the, the, the legal strategy wasn't ever uh, the main strategy of the movement, but it was one of them. It was, and I think it's, it's more to relate to the broader public and trying to, to legitimate, because when you have, when you show, because occupations, they are always seen as illegal. You are you are confronting what is basic, what is a private right to private property. Is everyone think, wow, this is like the basic, most basic individual right. And therefore, when you are capable of grounding that claim uh, in something that legitimate and says, well, but we also have the right to housing, and there is the, the property has to fulfill a social function, and if it's not fulfilled, it should not be protected by the state. It makes it much uh, easier to relate. To the broader public and to, to bring more uh, more participants and more uh, support for for the struggle. Yeah. So the, I yeah, I guess I answered one of them. <laughs> yeah. Well, why I am doing it? Um, I, I mean, I am from Chile. I grew up in Chile during the dictatorship, and it's very interesting because in um, Next year is going to be the 30 years uh, anniversary of the big uh, uprising of the peoples in Chile. Actually, it's very dramatic because the dictatorship uh, in Chile ended in a kind of agreement. But behind that, there was a huge movement. So people died fighting against the dictatorship, right? And I was a child, but I was part of that too. And after that, I went to university to study law and social sciences. I became a lawyer. I worked as a lawyer for eight years. I was a labor right lawyer. I'm working with the movement. The students were among my clients, so they went to my office to help, to ask for help. So I was part of that movement. So quite activist, been a lawyer, and blah, blah, blah. Then I moved to Sweden, and I, I had started a kind of interest to systematize this question of the ecological crisis in Chile because of my work with some workers within the forestry sector, uh, within the agribusiness sector. So I was really trying to make sense of all these struggles that are not all the time connected, right? So I went to Sweden, I started to work at the university there, I finished my PhD, I write scientific articles about forestry and other things, I have some of these things here if you are interested. But I cannot understand academia today as something that is there and the struggles are over there. So I am struggling both within academia and also when I am in Chile and Brazil trying to be part of the movement, right? So that is my main reason. I see this as my struggle, but I cannot struggle uh, alone, so I struggle with more people. I try to just uh, cooperate, so I would say. That is uh, our thinking horizontality, right? I mean, when I am in the field, the question of horizontality today is so important because even when I, I read things, I can maybe refer to Shayano, idea of the peasant economies. I mean, when I am with the ecological movement, so it's not only the point to know about history, about you know intellectual debate. It's just to know how to preserve the land today, how to struggle, and how to be smart enough in order to keep your land, not to sell it to the big companies, and also to create a political movement and to be all the time trying to move things, right? And that is something that really makes me, me think about the, the issue of you know, the different kind of movement we have today. And I also think that, uh, as I mentioned in my presentation, I mean, if we take seriously the social ecological crisis of today, we need to think uh, along the line of peasant uh, movement. So that is my uh, simplest question to the issue I presented today. Then, and the territory is just one of the most important things for peasant uh, struggles. So if you don't have territory, I mean, you cannot be a peasant, right? You have to have a territory or to fight for a territory. So, and the idea of territory is so important because it actually transcends the more maybe reductionist view of just land, right? I mean, there is a lot of interest in the territory of how people, the Mapuche people, for example. When you are in the Mapuche area, you see all over the places our territory, fighting for our territory, I mean, this is our territory, right? 
But the persons that I'm referring to, they chose to even transcend that and to say this is the territory and we are managing the territory. <coughs> we own the land, which all actually create this discussion about property right, right? If we remember the struggle between Bakunin and Marx, actually they were, one of the points was that actually Marx wanted to recognize the inheritance right to the peasant in order to not antagonize the peasantries in the first international. But Bakunin wanted to just be more, you know, against any property rights. So, for present property rights are important, and many people in the left don't understand that. When they go with their discourses and they try to say the peasant, they are going to say, oh, wow, well, the peasant are the peasant, right? So that is something important to consider, and it has to do with territory. I finish with that. Well, the passion question, I'll try to make a short, short story, a long story short. Um, actually, I was a human rights lawyer in Panama. Um, I went into involved in NGOs in Panama. Um, but the thing is that I got in trouble. Uh, we didn't tell them they were on a panel with lawyers. <laughs> 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 it was the secret that was coming out. But yeah, everyone's a lawyer <laughs> here. I'm sorry. Um, and the thing is that I got in trouble. Uh, I got in trouble because the, the, the thing is that the, after the president came to power, the president um, he came to power like on writing a wave of hope and optimism. Guys, the guy was going to change Panama, and indeed Panama is growing at 11 percent. Like it's 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 a miracle story that people think it's going to become the next Singapore of America, bring on the subway and a lot of public works projects. But the thing is that four months into the whole thing, uh, he did he basically let like basically ordered a really nasty repression in you know, the region. You know, we some environmental groups and like some people prominent you know, political leaders and, 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 and some I was writing at a newspaper at the time. They tell, they tell me, well, oh, right, you know, scientists, uh, this uh, communique about, like, trying to, you know, tell them to stop, right, and do a negotiation, and all that got me into trouble. And like, luckily I was here, so, but, uh, and, but there, like, th that thing spiraled to, be, to other more complicated things, which are not a problem here, which I, and I want to argue with it. Um, and the other thing, the problem is that it's the, the, the political urban indifference question, which was that um, the thing is that this, the, the, the pandemic government right now is going, going through so much like, pro, like problems. And I remember when I was, when, as I said, I was, I was a young, when I was younger, uh, there were massive mobilizations to basically oust uh, a very popular, uh, and then he was the, uh, he was a dictator. He, now he, the president got elected democratically. Sure, true. So the qualitative difference, but the allegations are serious, and people took to the street before to this. And but now it, now it is because unemployment is four percent. Basically, it's all quiet. The only people that are making right like good like a, 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 a coherent demand on how to change. For the better and to strengthen the democratic process, are indigenous movements in Panama, and the Navajo in, in, in particular, like they, they basically are, are want a, a, a more expansive definition of citizenship, basically not based on the goods you can actually get in your in your in your in your country, and to basically to foster an active reproduction of a nation state, but basically they want to basically be able to enjoy a, a, a right to difference and a right to 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 be to be able to be accepted part of this country of this polity. But at the same time, recognizing the differences that make up or will strengthen the polity, and the things that and, and be able to to, to um, actually like uh, uh, I have the definition here, but I was I was back up, um, and to basically be able to be, like, recognize, recognize a unity through difference. But this actually has challenges, and this is not as easy as academics, as Garcia can clean says, it's, it's, it's going to happen. This thing has many challenges, and one of the challenges basically is the the, the, very, the difficulty in trying to separate consumption and production and, and basically given the high demand of commodities in China and the fact that urban, urban populations that are traditionally the ones that are mobilizing against um, basically the ones that vote basically are just silent. Sorry, very extended. Okay. That's good. And we can, if people are okay with going to like 5.15, we can go a little bit over. But if people walk out, that's fine and no one's going to be offended. <laughs> I mean, I kind of take that to be true no matter what. If you walk out, you walk out. <laughs> Um, did you want to respond to these or do you want to guess? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, so I want to respond to the um, what's the purpose or like what, what we see ourselves or why are we interested in this. Um, for me, actually, I'm interested in this issue because I'm interested in education. Um, and uh, I think that there's actually a lot that makes these protests super interesting even beyond some of the things I highlighted. 
Um, Chile is considered to have like some of the best education in Latin America. On the PISA, which is this um, international um, test put on by the OECD, uh, Chile has been getting the highest scores. And um, it's also um, the policies implemented by Pinochet were really like the most extreme voucher system, like directly what Milton Friedman would have called for. So it's sort of this interesting uh, privatized experiment in terms of education. And so uh, th considering the, the former, that it's um, doing so well, it's sort of interesting that this, it's this got, gotten this big movement, right? Because like, why is the place that's doing well having this big movement? Um, so that's one interesting thing for me. And then also with this, with the voucher system, you hear a lot of the, um, dialogue in the United States calling for voucher systems and more, I don't know, you, you can think about that this is the most extreme and given that there's such grave inequality and that people are really mobilizing over it, what does this mean for how we should think about our education policies here? Um, and then another interesting thing, which I think maybe, maybe Mariana, as you're Brazilian, yeah, would, could speak to is, so their demand, some of the demands are for, you know, free education, but from what I know about Brazil, where um, university, you know, some of the best universities are the free ones where only the kids who have like a really good, went to private school, go there, we might think about, well, is that actually like, like, how do we square that demand with the fact that these protests are coming from a place of anger over inequality and would that actually solve inequality? So, just wanted to highlight some more interesting issues raised by these protests. So, my, I think these are fascinating because it makes me realize about what biases I bring about why I approach it the way I do. And I guess my perception is I'm very interested, I've been increasingly convinced of the power discrepancy between citizens mobilizing and how the state responds. Um, and I guess I'm increasingly convinced that by better understanding how the government, that there's a huge potential to understand how the government responds and therefore better facilitate relations between, um, for me, between minority groups and the way that the government can respond. Which, again, is fascinating because I do, I know I take a, a, a different approach to understanding social movements, and, um, but it's useful to think that I have some, you know, there's some theoretical bias behind. No, it's good. It wasn't a critique. It was a, I mean, I think all no, of us very, thinking about ourselves and the work that we do is an incredibly important thing. And we get so caught up in doing the work that sometimes we lose along the way why we're doing what we're doing. So it's really important. Um, but there's at least one hand, and maybe we should take, for the sake of time, are you all okay if we take, like, say, two or three questions at a time and then kind of respond to them? Otherwise, we probably won't have time for two. So one and two. Oh, thank you. Yes, uh, I. I have to say, I'm not a Latin Americanist, so uh, it's, 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 it's a fine if you think questions are not worth answering or something. But, well, first of all, Christian, <coughs> I was getting interested, you, you, you constantly speak about the peasant. I was wondering, who's, how do you define the peasant? Is it the same as a worker? Because, um, I mean, even Marx says uh, the local proletariat is a little bit cynical about and cannot really engage in politics. And, I mean, from Stephen McClover, the poor, and um, I mean, the weapons of the weak by Scott, we learned that the peasants actually have not the opportunities or, for, for various reasons, do not participate in political movement. So, if you use a peasant, the term so heavily, you basically turn this around, and this is groundbreaking. So I was wondering yeah. if this is really the case, or if you're really, if you rather refer this peasant to a more broader or less defined concept. And um, just to, to, to shoot this um, also out here, um, I, I was wondering, Leslie, how do you define institutions? To what extent are institutions something normative, something what is not just, let's say, the right to vote, but maybe also something what has to do with agenda setting? And can this, in a way, explain the problem you are looking to explain? Because I have the feeling you define institutions rather in a very um, well, material way or legal way, and not so much in a normative, discursive way, maybe. But this is just a hunch, so I was wondering how you define this. But. Um, yes. Okay, so hold oh, for a second, and then we're going to go to another one. Okay, um, most uh, my comments are on the papers on Chile, and one of the things that's really noticeable is that the three of you speak about the three sectors that are most mobilized by chance, right? In the countryside, um, recent, most recently in that bed, um, the mountain face, and the um, education. So you're, you're focusing on different but you're seeing a mobilization, a remobilization in Chile in various sectors, not one of them. Um, the second thing I would point out about this, I, I want to respond first to the paper on the Mapuches, because I would be very, very careful 
um, with terms like violent protests and, and, and especially terrorism. I mean, there is no evidence that this is terrorism. This is a, a government you right. know, discourse. And, right. and, if, and if you're calling it violent, what do you mean by that? I mean, has, has or Putin's killed anyone? Has anybody been seriously injured? I mean, so you're really talking about confrontational versus working through the system. Mm -hmm. um, and then I would ask, A, you know, why are some of the Mapuches more confrontational? Why are some working through the system? What's the difference? Do some have political connections? Is there a political difference? So what's going on? And the reality is, even if you have this one little group that succeeded, your story is not of success, right? It's 16 a year actually get what they're doing. So it, there's, the overall story is a failure for the Mapuche. So there's, you know, there's reasons that you see a much more controversial. <coughs> um, on the educational system, you know that in January they did a study of the schools, and they said the schools are awful. Right? Everything but the private schools in the wealthy neighborhoods. So there's been a huge decline in the qualities of education in Chile. Um, I would not see the, um, the democracy as an open system, though. It's a really blocked system. But I think what you might, what's interesting about comparing the Pinguinos to the current movement is that maybe what the critique of the political opportunity structure should be that, and a lot of people are talking about these kinds of cycles of opening and closing, in which um, Michel Bachelet was was a, a, a sense that maybe there would the state would be responsive. Now, of course, it's Sebastian Pinera. Nobody expected him to be responsive. <laughs> so, um, and the other thing that. There's an article by Chrissy et al. who, similar to Kitchell, they bring in another aspect, which are political parties, and whether there are political parties alive with the movement. So when left-wing parties are out of power, movements have more resources. And so I wonder how much of the shift to Piñera it can be explained, um, you know, the mass mobilization now. Um, and. I, I think that's pretty much it. I think we might take maybe one more before we. How many people are thinking they have a question or a comment? Okay, so we'll take the two, and then just for the sake of time, that way you can all respond, and then we'll see where we go after that. And if people have to walk out, we're still okay. Okay, that's it. Um, question, question on the commodities, uh, the demo commodities. Now, um, in the Rio Grande do Sul case that you cite. Um, Say that one of the the resource issues come, resources come from Petrobras. Um, if you're looking at what's an ecological movement here, I mean, in the longer run, that doesn't seem something that's green, so to speak. Um, is the goal of this particular um, uh, what's the word? What's the word for the, the settlement for this particular assentamento? Is that right? For, the, for this particular settlement that you're looking at, the Tigari or the cooperative, right? But on, but it's on an MST settlement, correct? No, no, no. Is that, that is one of uh, the things that are happening in the same area. In the same, but, okay. Yeah, I can explain maybe that better. But okay. Yeah, maybe ahead, maybe please. I'm confused. Uh, my yeah. understanding was that you were saying that the some of the funding was coming from Pet Petrobras yeah. for for the micro distillery, right? The technology, right? And, and, stuff and I guess what I'm asking is if the longer you you made a comment that social movements have to get a resource of some Longer term is the goal to develop that sort of indigenously within yeah, um, right. the area right. there. And Mariana, I'm um, struck with that figure you give of the hundred thousand, five hundred thirty thousand roughly cases, and then three thousand. Sounds like the the land question for some of the MST and the land movements are dealing with. Um, I'm wondering, um, you talk about autonomy of the law, and this being your career area before you came here. Um, to what extent can the law be used as an organizing tool uh, to develop some sort of greater autonomy to eat into that 100,000 figure? Um, and with the World Cup specifically, since Bellow is a site for some of the matches coming up in two years, um, 
does that have any impact in terms of um, how it progresses? Yeah, just a quick comment, Christian. We're aware that John Bellamy Foster Monthly Review has put out, I assume, many, many articles and a whole bunch of books on the connection with Marx and the ecological movement. And, this is, and he's stressing that many people are ignorant of this, and this should be a major point of attention. I know. Okay, so I think, you know, there were very specific questions, but then if people want to respond also generally, because some of the questions about, like, you know, where do you get your funding for autonomous development or whatever might actually also apply to kind of one for the indigenous communities. So we just kind of go in order. So you start. But I'm going to time you because you got so many yeah. questions. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So we're going yeah. to keep you yeah. like three and a half with, max. Yeah, John Bellamy Foster has done, done a very great job. And there is a lot of discussion going on, on the way of thinking, well, even Marx in relation to ecology. So I know him, so we are, I contributed to a book that he's also contributing. That's coming now, I have a copy of my article that I can make some advertising. It's Ecology of Power, just published this year. Collected a number of articles about people trying to develop a critical, uh, well, a research uh, perspective on environmental issues. It's a great job of many, yeah. Then just to show a comment on Chile, because it's so important what you are saying, and I just wanted to say that when people try to understand Chile today, they, they have to look at the historical trajectory of neoliberalism and the so-called transition into something they call democracy, right? That is so important, because it's not only the case of the students, it's not only the case of this peasant, it's also the case of the forestry workers, the salmon workers, the mining workers, and everything taking place in the last 10 years, right? And during 2004, we organized uh, the uh, country meeting when George Bush came to the country, and we were uh, almost 60,000 people on the street in a struggle that lasted the whole day. So you have to say that uh, for some reason, and for Chinas like me, what is going on today is something that at some moment was necessary to happen, and the important thing today is to hope uh, to create a more sense of a project, right? And even within the movement, and to take uh, Camila Vallejo's example, so there are many struggles today and discussions about the role of political parties, uh, grassroots movements, so it's a very dynamic situation. So please don't idolize Chile, don't reify the case of Chile, but just please look at Chile as a good example of a very important fight against neoliberalism. So don't forget Chile is the neoliberalism symbol of the world. And just to take the question of peasant, of course, it's a very context-dependent question in many cases, but there is a revival of peasant studies today. And I would say the emphasis is on the question of the reconstitution of the peasantries. And some people argue that you, for example, uh, Shanin had a very conventional category, the, the size of the land, blah, 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 you know. But today people are more thinking first in how people identify themselves. In the case I'm talking about, people identify as peasants, right? So many people declare the peasantries died many years ago, and Marx was almost saying that in some ways, but don't forget that Marx changed a little bit when trying to make sense of Russia and the struggles in France. So trying to give a place of the peasantries as a political actor. What he was saying that finally the peasants decided the struggles in France in 1850 and 1848. Either they didn't cooperate with the worker or they were trying to put their own agenda. So, Peasantry is a very interesting uh, political subject, and what I am emphasizing in the period of my paper here is that they say themselves as political subjects, right? In the two cases, or most in the case of Brazil. In Chile, it's more incipient process, but in Brazil, it's very clear. You have peasant movements. One book I can recommend, even when I have many critiques, is The New Peasantries by Jean Claude Van der Plot. But Philip McMichael from Cornell University has done a very great job in order to understand current peasantries. That would be my is quest uh, answer and if I can take the next one or no? Sure. Can sure. you do it really briefly? Yeah, the, the, pe the Petrobras, uh, well, just to explain, I mean, the fact. I mean, for these uh, communities, uh, they can get a lot of support from, for example, research at the university. They can invent their own technologies, right? But in order to offer something that is more convenient today, they had the idea to go to Petrobras to get the money. And well, Petrobras put, you know, the uh, advertising there. Petrobras is financing this one. But it's their own uh, ent enterprise, right? They run the micro distilleries. They needed the technology. And they can control the production and the consumption system. So that is the important fact. 
And it's very interesting because in one of the main statement of the uh, Movimiento de los Pequeños Agricultores, or Pesant, the, the group in which this cooperative is part of, they say, well, people sometimes don't want to get money from the state, right? That is a wrong strategy because that is money that all, is, uh, all Brazilians should take part of that, right? So they try to make the case that in this kind of transitional period, in order to create these technologies, in order to dispute the hegemony, sometimes we have to negotiate, right? So they are part of many initiatives, but what is important is to see how they try to project the project beyond the limit of the current institutional system. So that would be my um, quick answer to that, but I would really like to continue discussing that because it's so important to understand that there is not a kind of purity in the political engagement of this movement, right? I mean, we have to survive first, and then we try to do the things that we can uh, see as the future uh, project for us. And these kinds of questions are also, as the weekend goes on, so relevant for the contemporary movements as well, saying maybe we don't want to necessarily have a relationship to the state or you're creating autonomy, but then where does funding come from? Is the money in the state actually ours? What does that look like? How do you... So all the questions, I think, that have been, you know, they've been grappling with in Latin America in the past 10 years yeah. in particular are super relevant to the questions that are being raised by the movement. Did yeah. you want to address any of those? No. I'm going to let you the time okay. for you guys to... <laughs> Okay, so the, the point of uh, how law can be used as an instrument of organizing. Uh, I think this is a question not only for this particular movement, but for every social movement that is engaged in struggle. At some ways, like movements that you will be uh, treated as illegal, that you will be, uh, uh, they be criminalized, and they have to face the question of the law in the legal system. And uh, and I really see that uh, law has to be used as a, as a, as a, as a it, it has to be one of the strategies of the movement. And you really have to have this legal strategy as a way to create a counter hegemonic discourse. Because there is a dialectic relationship between law and politics. And the meaning of these rights, it's not a given, but it's constructing the political struggle. So once you cannot be trapped in the, in the idea that once the, that legal right is finally, uh, you finally achieve that right, the struggle is over, it, much, it goes much beyond that, but, has, but that has to be something. And it's also important to even like to maintain uh, the force of the social movement because every legal victory that you have and every occupation of this that is enabled to, ma to maintain for some more five, six months is a big victory for the movement and it's a way that people, uh, those who are, who are still uh, in doubt if they're gonna join or not, they see it as an alternative for them in order to accomplish their, their right to housing. So I think it's really a strategy that should be uh, used uh, understanding uh, what, are the, what are the consequences of that. And then the, in regards to the World Cup, uh, uh, as new social movements emerging around Brazil of, uh, of people who are uh, impacted by the, by the constructions and uh, because many communities are being displaced uh, and the social impact of, uh, of, the, of the construction both for the World Cup and for the Olympics is huge. So this, is, this has become a, a big political issue. Social movements are organizing. Uh, but it's, uh, it's, it's been really hard and complicated to make it a public question and to have the broader public engage on it because there is also the issue, well, but Brazil is emerging. It's, uh, uh, it's getting so well known outside. So this is a minor question when you look at what will be the benefits of the country. But, but I, I would say that the, the questions of housing, they are being even worsened with the, with the displacements that are happening now. Okay, um, first, I completely agree with you about the question of violence and confrontation. And unfortunately, I think the, the framing of the whole conflict is something that the government is almost using as a way to, to polarize um, between different, uh, between more moderate and more um, confrontational or radical or whatever the right word is. Um, but the government has been using, this relates back to your question about legal issues, the government has been using an old, a law dating back to sometimes during Pinochet, um, to process these, these arrests as terrorism, so I completely agree. It's very, it's um, not very clear what counts and what doesn't. Um, so I, I do need to be careful about that. Um, your question about um, whether there was any success at all, unfortunately I think there, the success is limited enough that keeps that keeps the communities going through the government. It's enough to make them work through the process. Um, the other issue that is also hard to deal with is that um, 
in most cases, these are very long negotiations. So the government will approve the request, but then that requires negotiations with the current landowner. So a lot of times, I think there's enough interaction with the government that keeps the process going on. So even if it may not be completed, there's still that interaction with the government while they're trying to negotiate a sale from the private landowner. So it's enough success that keeps them kind of through the process. Um, and then the last question about why, kind of at the root of this is why do some communities use more, are more willing to confront the government than others? Um, this is originally where I started the, the project, and I think once I get down to Chile, it's something that will be much easier while I'm there. Um, it's just hard to get a hold of these things from the U.S. Um, the two and the two easy answers I've gotten is um, proximity to the international corporations. So if there's a if there's a, a com not even necessarily international, but the more that there's some corporation using that land, that seems to exacerbate the conflict. Um, but then I think also there's that story of interaction with the state, and they're kind of paths seem to diverge really really quickly depending on what that community's initial interaction with the state was. So those are the two initial answers I'll give you. I'm going to step out of line for one second and just like as an additional question perhaps to think about when you're doing this is you know with the question of success those movements those parts of the movement that have been more using forms of direct action and defending the land physically mm -hmm. that as compared to the successes of neighboring land. Mm -hmm. So sometimes it's the direct action of one part of a movement that actually, mm -hmm. you know, kind of look at one as it relates to the right. other because perhaps there's a right. connection no, between the really true. Um, yeah. Okay, um, so first, how do I define institutions? That's like a great, a great question, but um, I'm also, I'm a political scientist, so I'm, I'm like defining it in more of a, maybe like a, so, so maybe like a Northian sense, like on one hand, parchment institutions, like the Constitution, and, and then, you know, organizations within that, like, Congress and the president and whatever. Um, and then oh, there's also informal institutions. But I only brought up institutions just to say that um, Kitschel defines political opportunity structure in terms of institutions. And for him, it's things like political, the political party, whether it's a federalist country, things like that. Um, and actually, I don't, I, I'm don't, i not totally sure that actually institutions are even that important for my theory. Because I feel like I'm, I'm saying more, I, I want to take more than like tarot definition of political opportunity structures and say that it has more to do with sort of government signaling when those sort of um, organizational type institutions are staying constant. Um, so, but actually I think your point about agenda setting is interesting and I hadn't really thought about that. Um, and I think actually maybe what I'm trying to say is that um, that's why salient issues matter. Like maybe there's sort of a reverse agenda setting happening. Like when society starts caring about an issue, the government is forced to respond somehow, and, and so I think maybe that, that's an interesting idea that maybe I can kind of build into what I'm trying to say. Yeah, even though I would understand agenda also as an institution. Yeah. In a way, but, but, but it, Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, that's, I feel like that's a big question, like what are institutions? Um, and then this point about political parties, um, yeah, that definitely, that, that, I, I should read that, that sounds really interesting. But the interesting thing is, granted, I'm using survey data from Latino barometers, barometer survey, so this is just people's willingness to protest. But I, this result of people being more willing to protest in 2007, Bachelet is the president then. Um, but, but your point, I think, is more about the mobilization, like how like the money for the actual protest to happen and all the, those other things. Um, and then the point about the, the poor schools. Yeah, for sure, I, I agree with you. The PISA is an interesting thing because it's an app. You know, when you say Chile did really well in the PISA, it's like an average. So, yeah, for sure. I mean, so, the PISA says compared to other countries, but does it over time? Because the quality of education. I mean, they, it's been, I think there was one in 2009, there was one in 2005, I think, and in both years, Chile did really well. But you're right, if you look at, like, so it, the, when I say they do well, I'm just saying on average, Chile's doing well. But that's, that's probably reflecting the really high performers from private schools. And that's part of the issue, is the inequality. Sorry. No, I'm seeing a glass of wine developing after <laughs> the here, which is how we should, I think, see all of this as like the beginning of a conversation that will continue on for the next two days. So, great. Bye.